This is the second video for the ethics and legal considerations part of the animal chiropractic class. Just as a general overview of the ethical rules, one thing to keep in mind is to work with each other's professions. It's important for the chiropractors to understand and respect that the veterinarians have far more training in working with animals and will have far more knowledge about certain issues dealing with the animals and, and will have far more ability to examine and, and provide different treatment options for the animals than a, a licensed chiropractor could provide. The other thing that's important is I think the veterinarians need to keep in mind that the chiropractors are going to have more knowledge ab about chiropractic techniques and how chiropractic works and how it may be used in connection with animals. The uh, Both professions need to understand that taking a, a class that covers a few weekends is not a substitute for the years of training that the other profession has received in their respective areas of expertise. Historically, the legal system has looked at animals like a piece of property. And in many ways, the legal system continues to look at animals like a piece of property. But as our society has evolved, we really have very different considerations about the importance of animals and the importance of animal rights. Uh, people are much more connected to their pets and are much more willing to spend more money on their patients, on their pets than they have ever done before. Uh, for example, there are cases where uh, uh, owners of, of a dog that is not worth much or doesn't have much of a market value, the owners have spent tens of thousands of dollars in veterinary bills trying to help that animal uh, become well. So the problem is that from the legal system, we still look at animals as, as being a piece of property that has a market value that's defined at a fairly low level. But when we look at our sentimental value to the animals, we wind up with a value that's much, much higher and may or may not be appropriate uh, uh, when we're measuring damages in, in making choices later on. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is with respect to ethics is remember that you have obligations to several different groups. One thing that's different for the chiropractors is besides just having an obligation to your patient, you also have an obligation to your client. It is the client who's not a patient, the human, who's not a patient, who's going to be making the decisions about what care the patient does and does not receive. And of course, the patient has no way to communicate to us uh, uh, what care they want to receive. So it's the client's decision. And the other thing that's different is clients in some cases are going to be much more sensitive to the cost of care than they might not have been in other, with uh, dealing with human patients. Uh, it's rare that there's pet insurance that will cover the uh, animal chiropractic uh, care. Um, so the client's going to be paying for this out of pocket. Now, because of our close connections to our pets, some clients are going to be willing to spend a considerable amount of money. And in many cases, the clients are more willing to spend money on their pets than they're willing to spend on themselves. Uh, but be aware that it's, it's ultimately the client's decision. And, and as the care provider, uh, it's important to involve the client, to communicate to the client uh, what the alternatives are and what the cost of those alternatives might be. That second group that you have an obligation to is to your peers and to the profession. Animal chiropractic is a very young profession and there's very few people involved in the profession at this point. But as the profession grows, and I do expect it to grow, as the profession grows, it will become subject to more and more public scrutiny. And like any profession, there are many practitioners who are very capable and very ethical. But there's always a few practitioners who are always looking for ways to uh, uh, increase their profits and don't much care about how they get there uh, or people who are just flat looking to take shortcuts. 
And just a few of those people in the animal chiropractic profession can do a great deal of damage. Uh, unlike other professions, the uh, uh, animal chiropractic profession does not have a lot of uh, uh, brand awareness. The public's not very aware of animal chiropractic. So although there are some people who are very ardent supporters of the profession, it would be very easy to do a lot of damage to the profession by engaging in unethical, inappropriate conduct. Uh, animal chiropractors also need to remember that they have an obligation to protect the public health. If they become aware of an animal with a disease that could be contagious, uh, or if they become aware of an animal with tendencies that can be dangerous, they have a, a, a duty to protect not just the animal and not just the client, but to protect the public from that danger. And of course, lastly, remember your ethical obligation, and of course, this is the primary obligation, is to the patient, to the animal involved. And that brings us to the first of the general rules, which is most decisions should be made based on what is in the patient's best interest. Uh, it shouldn't be based on uh, uh, the client's uh, uh, preference, well, I'm just, let me back that up, client is involved in it, but the ultimate decision, the primary consideration should be the needs of the patient. Uh, the AVMA uh, principles of ethics uh, provides that a veterinarian should first consider the needs of the patient to prevent and relieve disease, suffering, or disability while minimizing pain or fear. AVMA, of course, is the American uh, veterinary Medical Association, um, and, and this is one of their key uh, principles of ethics, is to put the patient's interest first. It's also important to be honest, and honesty, of course, covers a number of areas. Uh, first, to the public, any advertising needs to be extremely honest with respect to animal chiropractic about what can be expected, what the expenses might be, what the uh, training or specialization of the uh, provider might be. But beyond just traditional advertising, it's also important to be honest to the public when you're, you're, you're speaking in public about animal chiropractic. Uh, when you're providing education or participating in educational programs about animal chiropractic, and when you're describing your credentials as either a chiropractor or a veterinarian involved in animal chiropractic. It's also important to be honest in dealing with clients, make honest recommendations. I think one of the key duties of any professional is to be certain that your clients develop realistic expectations. They need to understand what is likely to occur and what you may be trying to accomplish. Sometimes what's possible is not always what they want or hope for, and they need to understand that difference uh, so that they're uh, uh, realistic in, their, in making their decisions. It's also important to be honest in dealing with colleagues. When you're consulting with other doctors, it's important to be honest about uh, what the situation is and what you have done. Uh, when you're discussing the results of animal chiropractic uh, with other colleagues, other professionals, or with uh, clients, it's important to be honest about the results that have uh, occurred. One of the nice things about working with animals is unlike people, animals do not exaggerate the results. If they respond to a treatment, it's a very genuine response and very honest response. Uh, it shouldn't be necessary to exaggerate that. It's also important if you publish, uh, particularly academic papers, or research papers. It's important that we maintain the strictest level of honesty in making those publications because, again, 
dishonesty in those areas to the public, to the client, and to colleagues can do a lot of damage to this new profession. And then finally, a quick comment about honesty with respect to credentials. Uh, one thing that happens is, is we often refer to healthcare providers as doctors. And that doesn't distinguish the doctors who are trained to work on animals from the doctors who are trained to provide chiropractic to people. As an animal chiropractor, I think it's important to clearly express your credentials. Uh, we'll talk more about licensing in, in a future video, but it, if you're a chiropractor, you need to clearly identify yourself as a chiropractor. If you're a veterinarian, you need to clearly identify yourself as a veterinarian and acknowledge the limitations of what you may know about chiropractic. Uh, the next ethical rule is to provide only care that is necessary. Um, a number of the rules of the AM, AVMA principles deal with conflicts of interest and avoiding those conflicts of interest. And the primary reason to avoid those conflicts of interest is to uh, avoid situations where the doctor is providing an excessive amount of care. So among other things, the AVMA code says that doctors should, of course, consider the potential for creating a conflict of interest when deciding whether to participate in vendor incentive programs. So for example, if you're receiving a bonus uh, from a, a product supplier for selling their product, that's something that may be an issue creating a conflict of interest. Uh, the Code of Ethics also says the medical judgment of a veterinarian shall not be influenced by contracts or agreements made by their associations or societies. Uh, and lastly, a veterinarian shall not offer or receive any financial incentive solely for the referral of a patient. No fee splitting, no referral fees. The rules also require confidentiality. Um, Doctors, animal chiropractors should respect the confidentiality of their clients and should protect the confidentiality of their records. Even though the, the HIPAA rules that apply when you're working with humans may not apply, will not apply when you're working with animals, uh, I think it's a good idea to follow the same kind of uh, privacy procedures and in, in safeguards that you would follow with your human patients. If you're working on humans and animals, it's a good practice anyway. But it's a good, uh, uh, it's important to protect confidentiality. Now, in most cases, if uh, uh, a neighbor finds out that their neighbor's dog has heartworm, that may not be a particularly damaging admission. But there are also situations where you may be working with uh, animals of higher value, like a racehorse, and disclosing that a racehorse has a particular problem, you know, a, a chiropractic problem or a gait problem, uh, that could be a very damaging uh, disclosure of confidential information. So you need to respect the confidentiality of the client, protect the confidentiality of the records. Uh, consent. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier in the first video that consent's a little bit different for animal chiropractic because it is considered an alternative type of care. So because it's an alternative, it is more critical to be sure that the client understands it's an alternative and understands what the traditional care might be, what the options are, and what the risk and, and likely outcomes of those options are. The other thing that's I think important about getting consent is it can help protect the doctors involved from malpractice claims. If a client has helped make the decision about what care the patient will receive, if the client has made a, a decision that turns out poorly, they're more likely to accept their own responsibility for it if they were involved in making that decision. On the other hand, if the doctor makes a decision to provide animal chiropractic, without disclosing that it's an alternative, that's going to expose them to uh, a malpractice claim. Uh, competence is also one of the obligations. 
it is important first to obtain the skills and the knowledge that you need to provide the care. Uh, it would not be wise for a veterinarian to provide chiropractic care to animals without receiving any training or any education in chiropractic. Um, obtaining that education, learning from others who have provided that kind of care before is a, a useful way to uh, uh, gain skills. And I want to congratulate those of you in this class. This is a, certainly an important step, whether you're a chiropractor or a veterinarian, in gaining the skills to provide effective care. And this kind of continuing education is, of course, required to uh, keep your licensing. Uh, consultations and referrals. I've talked about this before, but it's important to remember that the different professions have different areas of expertise. Uh, veterinarians go through years of training to learn how to work with animals. Uh, chiropractors go through years of training to understand chiropractic and how that works. And it's important for the two professions to work together and to consult with each other and to refer patients when appropriate to each other, not for financial gain, but to provide the best possible care for the patient and the best possible service for the client. Of course, fees should be reasonable. That's one of those rules that every profession is subject to. And every consumer who has to pay our fees says our fees are too high. Uh, but in the animal chiropractic world, uh, there's not much of a community market sometimes to look at to try to decide what fees are appropriate. Uh, one thing that I think is critical is to be sure as part of the consent process the fees are discussed so that the client understands what their, their financial obligation will be. Uh, should go without saying that you should obey the laws. One of the requirements and the principles of AVMA's principles of ethics, of course, is that you should obey the laws. And also, if you become aware of someone else who is committing a violation, that you should report that violation to the appropriate authorities. Uh, this will become most important as we talk about the licensing rules, uh, particularly for chiropractors who are treating animals. They need to be very attentive to what the rules are and what kind of supervision they need to be receiving as they treat animals. Uh, veterinarians are free to choose their patients and their clients. You know, just like human doctors, it is very flattering when someone offers to hire you, but it's a good idea to think about whether this is somebody you want to be working with um, and pay attention to red flags or, or indicators that perhaps this client or this patient may not be the best person for your practice. But on the flip side of that, once a doctor has established the veterinary client patient relationship, the doctor should not abandon their patients. If a doctor has decided to terminate care or the client has decided to terminate the veterinary client patient relationship, the doctor should try to refer the client to another provider. Um, and if a referral occurs, or if the client finds their, a new doctor on their own, either case, the original treating doctor should share the records with the new treating doctor and should work with them uh, in an appropriate way to get them up to speed on what's going on with the patient and to provide good care for the patient. Now, I know both the chiropractors and the veterinarians have been taught much more about ethics than what I just covered in the, the last 20 minutes or so. But this is a quick reminder of what some of the basic rules are. Uh, I think the two keys are, number one, keep the patient's interest first. Um, and number two, uh, respect each other's professions, respect each other's expertise, and share your expertise for the benefit of the patient.